Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast, a series focused on igniting your curiosity as a preacher and connecting you with the living word. Join me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson, along with Bandit the Podcast. As we gain insights and hear stories straight from working preacher authors about proclaiming an authentic word in challenging times. In this episode, we are talking with Donna Giver Johnston, author of Writing for the Ear, Preaching from the Heart in the Working Preacher Book series. Donna, we are so glad that you are here with us. Welcome to the Working Preacher Books podcast. Thank you, Caroline and Ralph. It is a joy to be here. So Donna, tell us a little bit about uh, you and who you are and what you're up to these days. Okay, so um, I have been uh, ordained as a minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church for 25 years, been serving different congregations uh, since then. I did take some time off to um, get a PhD in homiletics and liturgics. Uh, So with that, I have been doing some teaching at Pittsburgh Seminary, as well as writing some books. But mainly, you can find me every Sunday in the pulpit, uh, currently at Community Presbyterian Church of Ben Avon in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You are a working preacher. Indeed. (laughs) Right. Uh, Donna, in your intro uh, to this book, you write, it is essential in preaching to make connections. What connections are the hardest to make from the pulpit? Yes, thanks for the question. And I wanted to start actually by giving a shout out, a word of appreciation, a word of solidarity with all the working preachers out there. Um, Obviously, it has been a very, very difficult time during COVID, uh, very uh, disorienting, uh, very draining. Um, Some of you have been preaching to a little dot on your computer. I've been preaching to an empty, empty sanctuary. Uh, So it is really hard to make those connections with people when you can't even see them. Um, So when I'm talking about connection, I'm talking about um, connecting the word of God, the ancient word with the world today. I'm talking about uh, connecting with people that come with lots of different questions and wondering even how to listen today. I spent a lot of time in the first chapter talking about how, you know, in this secular postmodern Uh, pluralistic world, you know, it's very hard for people to even have the kind of attention, um, not having a familiarity with the the text, even uh, the the gospel narrative, the Bible. Um, So kind of that connection, as well as I'm thinking about like a deeper, when I say connection, which I use that word a lot in the book, it's talking about um, a relationship, a relevance, a sense of making it real for people, Um, a sense of community and communion, um, kind of a deep knowing um, kind of connection. So that's how I'm using the word connection. And that has been particularly hard uh, during COVID to make, but even at all times, I think trying to take an ancient text um, and speak to people who, you know, they, they have their phones and they have their clickers and they can change the channel very quickly. Um, so how do you really capture those um, ears in such an era of noise and, um, and distractions is really the, the hardest connection to make. You know, one thing I really appreciated about this book, uh, and I could say many things, but one thing I really appreciated in connection to connection is the way in which you're grounding uh, your, your argument, you're grounding also your method in in the incarnation and the theology Mm -hmm. of the incarnation and that uh, we have a God of connection. And Mm -hmm. that's really at one of the, that's the heart of what the incarnation is all about. And it made me think too, uh, with regard to you being a working preacher. And as you said, preaching to the green dot or preaching Mm -hmm. to, you know, a a Mm non-bodied sanctuary. How, how is that how has that changed your idea of and your thoughts about what does it mean to do incarnated preaching or preaching from a place of incarnation? Right. Yes, it is grounded in the incarnation. It's such an important part for me um, in connecting with people and, and preaching and pastoring. Um, I think what it what it has changed for me is, first of all, I couldn't after a month or two preaching to an empty sanctuary, I couldn't do it anymore. So I actually had my secretary make pictures, large pictures of everybody <laughs> in the church. <laughs> and you probably saw those online. 
and we put them all over the, the pews. So actually I could see people because uh, it was so important to actually see their faces. Mm. And I'll also say a word about, um, you know, as a, as a person who preaches every Sunday, um, so much of the incarnate preaching is really not just, doesn't just happen on Sunday morning, it happens all through the week. Mm -hmm. So it's making these connections with people, having deep relationships with them, uh, doing their funerals, their weddings, their baptisms, um, all of that creates a certain relationship. And so that's something that you can sort of just plug into. Um, as, as one person told me years ago, uh, when we had an interim who was serving as one of the pastors as well, he said, well, when are you going to preach next? And I, and I don't think it was because I was a better preacher, but he said, you know, we know you, we trust you, you love us. And so we meet you halfway. <laughs> mm -hmm. In other words, they're already halfway there uh, because of the relationship. So it's much easier to make that connection. Yeah, you know, that, that's so right. Uh, it's one of the reasons that, you know, Carolyn and I are often guest preachers someplace, uh, either filling in when a pastor is on vacation or some occasion, it's really hard to be a guest preacher for that exact mm -hmm. reason. Yeah. Uh, so tell, tell me about the title. Um, so writing, uh, writing, writing for the ear, mm -hmm. um, that of course is, uh, what's the word? It's a, that's a paradox, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> so you're writing for you to speak for the ear. Yes. Um, give a couple just kind of highlights that will uh, tease people into buying and reading the book, <laughs> which they should do. But, yeah, thank you. So it started off, you know, when I was serving a very large congregation in a large sanctuary with a tall pulpit. And I looked out and I just felt so disconnected from people. And as I was trying to read my manuscript, that was even just one more obstacle. And uh, so, <laughs> so what I realized is that I had to find some way to change that. Um, and so I got out my pen literally in the pulpit and I started just scratching things off and I started speaking the words out loud. And what I realized is that if I couldn't remember a sentence, then chances are good they couldn't either. Um, and so I really began to change the words that I use, the, the phrases that I use, the way I put things together. I began to do all of this editing in the pulpit as I was trying to remember uh, how I could be able to speak to them without using a manuscript. And so I sort of backed into it, um, realizing that uh, there was a better way to, to connect with my listeners. And that really was writing for the ear. And so you know the difference when you're reading a paragraph and has a long sentence and lots of, lots of wonderful words, which I love, uh, but they don't translate very well into a sermon. Um, and so to be able to speak in a way that people can actually hear and remember uh, what you said, um, as well as when you write for the ear, you have a better chance of remembering it as well. So you don't have to always be uh, looking down at your notes. So you, you just gave two things. I mean, one is shorter sentences mm -hmm. and um, whatever the common language and vocabulary of the community is. Those right. are two of the things. Well, that's an important thing for our, for our listeners to recognize is that what you're offering in this book is a way to communicate and make connection mm -hmm. that is uh, not so heavily manuscript based or to go off manuscript, to go off script, if you will, and, yeah. and, and, and really focus on exactly writing for the ear, which is, I think, one mm -hmm. of the hardest things as a teacher of preachers to teach. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. is to, uh, particularly in a seminary when all mm -hmm. of their other writing is academic yeah. and long prose. Right. And, and right. so it, it feels really uncomfortable. And I'm sure there are, are some of our listeners out there who are like, oh, the, the, the manuscript is the last thing I am ever going to give up mm -hmm. or preachers who are afraid that everything is going to just fall apart. The wheels are all going to fall off the truck if if they go off script. What, do you, what are some of your responses to that in that kind of like, you know, never, 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 I'm never gonna, I'm never not going to use a manuscript. How do you respond to some of those fears of working preachers out there? Yeah, the first thing I would say is just try it. You never know, you know, roll a six or roll a dice, you just might get a six kind of thing. Um, just give it a try. And I think what you might find is that you might be surprised. First of all, how easy, how much uh, simpler it is than you think. 
and also how you will be spiritually enriched. Um, you know, many times when I'm standing before my congregation and I'm preaching without a manuscript and I will sort of, um, you know, sometimes lose my place, if you will. And, uh, and just to be suspended in that place of trust, uh, just kind of waiting for the word to come um, and, and not being afraid to go in another direction. Or what often happens is I'll see somebody in the pews, which is why, again, that incarnational preaching is so important for me. I'll see Ed sitting there and I'll think, wow, his wife is back in the hospital. So I wonder how he could hear this differently. Or there's Chris, whose son is really struggling with addiction again. So I wonder how I could say this differently that would connect better with, with her. Um, and so it's a, it feels like it's a conversation, even though obviously I'm not having a conversation. It's very much more of a dialogue. And so in a dialogue, you have to be present. You have to be, you know, you have to be there. And so I think it is difficult, but it's not, I think once you work at it, you'll feel like that, that there is reward there. But don't take my word for it. My book really does provide other compelling reasons. So let me just talk about a few of those, if that's all right. Uh, first of all, it's rooted in history. So preaching traces its roots to an ancient oral communication of telling stories of faith, right? So passing those stories down from generation to generation. And then Clyde Fant in Preaching for Today claims that preaching has been trapped in the Gutenberg galaxy ever since the printing press was invented. So Fant challenges preachers to break out of this orbit and to return preaching to its original oral medium. Marshall McLuhan says, the medium is the message. So it's rooted in history and it's also grounded in theology. So the incarnation reveals a God who in the word becoming flesh did not just tell, but showed the depths of divine love. So as preachers of the word, I think we're called not just to tell, but to show. In other words, to embody God's word. So preaching is greater than the sum of the words written, right? It is the preacher's embodied performance, I think, of the word of God for the people of God. So that means less time on writing a manuscript quietly at the computer and more time on performing the sermon aloud. So it's rooted in history, it's grounded in theology, and finally, it's needed in our culture today. So people are disconnected from the church and the biblical narrative in today's postmodern secular society. People listen differently today. They're distracted. They um, have shorter attention spans, right, in this visual uh, stimuli, stimulating society with tweets and texts and such. And so we have to preach differently. So preaching needs to change so we can make connection with our listeners today. And I also wanted to say the reason I spent time thinking about my method, because people would often ask me, how do you do this? And I'd say, I don't know, I just do it. And so this book was about me trying to figure out how I do it. And I realized that the part of the writing process throughout the week is really important. So I'm not saying to pastors just on Sunday morning, I know you've written this manuscript, now give it to me. And you're just going to stand there and preach. That's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. It's about actually working through the whole week, knowing that you're going to preach without a manuscript helps you engage the text differently, helps you ask different questions, and helps you actually put the, put the sermon together differently. Okay, so I don't know how much you know about me, Donna, because uh, we don't know each other uh, very well, but you're going to be shocked that uh, my favorite part of the book was where you talk about Psalm 42. Mm. I know that shocks Caroline a lot, <laughs> but, Surprise! but it's not because it was about Psalm 42, but that in order to do this, you talk about needing to have the scripture memorized, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is something preaching from memorized text, then you can do that in the hospital, right? You don't even, you don't have to get yes. out your Bible. Yes. 42 is in you. Can you, can yep. you just say a little more? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. In the book, I wrote about how I was not looking forward to that assignment at all because I, I struggled with, you know, memorizing things. And I thought, well, why should you do that anyway? Because you can always just open up your Bible. Uh, but what I found is that I, I, re, I delivered it differently. I delivered it kind of tapping into my 
my spirit. Um, and it came out, uh, I interpreted the words actually, as I was speaking them more than I would just be reading from a flat text. And, um, and I remember the professor commenting about just how deeply moved she was, even as I was as well. And I realized that this is holy ground. Um, and so this has happened many times to me throughout my ministry on the way to the cemetery once, um, uh, they asked me, you know, can you, can you read Isaiah 43? And I said, oh no, I forgot my Bible. I was a new pastor, the associate pastor. I literally forgot my Bible. And I said, well, wait a second. I think I have this one. And sure enough, uh, you know, I had it in me. And so I could just say, you know, do not fear for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. Um, and so I think that there is great value in just having a text so much a part embodied literally uh, that it becomes uh, a spiritual experience for you as well as your listeners. That's uh, an insight um, that's new to me, uh, frankly, uh, mm. but it rings true. One of the best sermons I ever heard uh, was at a wedding of a friend of mine and the preacher got up uh, and he thought there would be a Bible in the um, pulpit and there wasn't. So, but he had worked on the sermons. So, so he told the story and Carolyn, you'll be glad to know it was gospel of John, uh, a <laughs> wedding at Cana wedding. And, but it was way better because he had mm. memorized it or he, close enough that, you know, he told the story. Yeah, that's really, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. Well, and also that, that telling of the story is, is one of the, I think the other, another really important aspect of this book, Donna, is the way in which you're not just making this up. It's not like, oh, this is, this would be a good idea. It's actually what scripture does. I mean, scripture right. was not, uh, we, we were able to read it now, but it was written down mm -hmm. to be heard, or as Walter Ong says, it's mm -hmm. scripture is textualized orality. So in yeah. some ways, we're, we're getting closer in your method to the ways in which scripture would have been experienced. Uh, and again, a connection to those early audiences. I want to ask you about the, I think there's another resistance to uh, to going off script, off manuscript, mm -hmm. and that is, or I would say not a resistance, but a misconception that, uh, and, 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 and you know this, you talk about this in the book, that people want you to, people want their preachers to go off script because they're, they seem more connected, and, mm -hmm. and, and there's this misconception that that uh, the Holy Spirit is just going to like come down and infuse <laughs> you with all these fabulous ideas. And my, uh, and, and it's all gonna happen on Sunday morning and it's gonna be brilliant. And, uh, but my preaching professor and, and, and Rolf's uh, Sheldon Tostegard would always say, yes, we trust in the spirit, but one should not tax the spirit too much. <laughs> and, and so you it's so you talk in the last chapter about uh, about doing a marathon, which is amazing mm -hmm. because I I recently ran a 0.5 k ish, so I'm feeling pretty <laughs> good about that. Uh, but preaching a sermon <laughs> is not a 15 minute sprint on a Sunday morning, nor right is it like this spirit that's just you know, going to infuse you with brilliance. It's more like a marathon, a week-long process that requires not only dedicated exegetical work, but also spiritual preparation. Mm -hmm. So could you say a little bit more for our listeners about, about the role of the Holy Spirit in the process that you are suggesting? And, right. and, in, and in part, be, in, to kind of correct that misconception of off manuscript preaching. Right. Yes, I wanted to make sure that's not what I'm suggesting at all. Yeah. <laughs> I, people to just show up on Sunday morning and say, okay, spirit, you know, speak a word. Um, that is usually a disaster uh, for everybody involved. Absolutely. So, and I also want to honor the fact that, you know, um, you know, we're, we're preaching the word of God, right? And so we want to take it seriously. Um, we want to make sure that we do the hard work. We get into the text. We ask the hard questions. We interrogate the text. We uh, in my process, I invite people around the text every Wednesday. We do a Bible study in the church. And so I listen for where are people questioning? Where's the tension? What, you know, what do they really need to hear about this text? So I never do um, any kind of uh, 
sermon prep work by myself. It's always in, within a community. Um, so I believe the spirit, right? Uh, we pray for a spirit of illumination uh, that the spirit is working in the community. Um, also, you know, throughout the week, I, I talk about spiritual care, you know, really trying to take care of yourself, uh, body, mind, and spirit so that you, you can be that channel. Um, that you can, you can, um, you know, allow the, the, the word of God to speak through you as well. Um, so whether it's Lectio Divina, whether it is, you know, daily devotions or meditation, um, in my case, you know, yoga, walking, you know, swimming in the pool actually is very spiritual for me as well. Um, so giving yourself a chance to listen uh, and to listen deeply to what the spirit is saying. And then just like Moses went up to the mountain, you know, on behalf of the people to hear a word and then brought it back down. The same thing is that basically on Sunday morning, I'm saying, I have been to the mountain. <laughs> you know, I've listened uh, for you uh, with your particular concerns. And here's what I heard. Um, and, uh, and so there's a lot of work that goes into it. And then in the moment, as I talked earlier, if you've done all your work, then you can really trust the spirit because the spirit has been with you the whole week. And so the spirit's also going to be with you in that moment. If you've worked on something and you can't remember it, um, then sometimes I'll get something else in the moment. And that'll be what was really needed to be said, but I didn't think of it that week. And so I think it's, you know, it's taken me a while to get to that point of trusting, you know, really trusting my work and trusting the community's work and trusting the spirit's work. And when all of that goes together, um, it's usually, um, you know, it's, it's usually a powerful experience. One last question about the book. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for writing it. And mm -hmm. uh, I really commend it uh, strongly. So the last question that is, one thing that I see happens to some preachers who um, quit using manuscript is they preach too long. Mm -hmm. uh, they think they're going to preach too short uh, without a manuscript, <laughs> but they actually go on and on like mm -hmm. I am now. So how do you, how do you not do that? <laughs> um, I say practice, practice, practice. So part of my method, which some people, some people might cringe on, but I actually get to the sanctuary pretty early on Sunday morning and spend at least an hour, uh, if not more, uh, practicing. And uh, so some of that is memorizing those key sentences that you really are important uh, to make sure that your message is, is communicated and, and ser serves as a bridge to get to the next part. Um, and the other part is just to get it embodied, you know, feel it in your body uh, in that space, looking around that sanctuary. Um, and so the more you practice, I think the better you get at getting rid of all that extra stuff that, you, that, that really doesn't need to be said. And I always time it. You know, I get out my phone and I and I push the timer and I make sure that it's not more, in my case, not more than 15 minutes um, and uh, and usually less than. So it gives me a little bit of room, you know, if the spirit moves in another direction. Well, another thing we like to do on these podcasts, Donna, is ask you some uh, more general questions about you as a, as a, and in your case, you as a working preacher and, mm -hmm. and how you can uh, provide some, you know, thoughts and advice for those working preachers who are listening out there. So what are some of the things that you do to get unstuck uh, <laughs> when you're when you're working on a sermon. And I, I, I think that a lot of what you talk about in the book is, is uh, can be methods mm -hmm. of unstuckness mm -hmm. in terms of memorizing the text and, mm -hmm. and, the, and then also gathering around with parishioners mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. that text. So I think you have so many things that are already built into mm -hmm. uh, to address that. But is there anything else that you might want to share with our listeners about how to you're, you know, you're just you're hitting the wall and nothing's mm -hmm. coming. And yes, what, been what, there. What, yeah. <laughs> I think no matter what your method is, you do have weeks where you get stuck, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a funeral that comes up or there's a crisis in the world or just uh, you're exhausted. Um, there's so many other demands of being a, a parish minister, as most of your, the listeners know. Um, so, yeah. So I have to give a shout out to workingpreacher.com. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. my go to. Uh, if I'm really stuck, uh, and usually I do it earlier in the week, but also it's always a good thing to go back to and read a couple 
of the essays uh, and the commentaries about the text, just if I'm looking for a certain insight that, I, I, that I'm not getting. Um, Salvatore ambulando is a Latin phrase that means it is solved by walking. And that's what I do a lot as well, just kind of get away from my computer, go out for a walk, uh, get out in nature. Um, in, other, in other words, put the sermon on the back burner and, and just kind of let it percolate. And usually when I come back to it, um, I've seen something. Um, another one is to just focus, like come up with one focus. So I, I learned homologs from Tom Long at Princeton and he taught us the focus function form. And so when I'm really struggling, I realize, oh, I don't have a focus. <laughs> so I try just to write a really brief focus and usually uh, that that's enough to to get me going. Can you yeah. give an example of, of like what was your focus uh, for yesterday? Uh, actually, I was off last week. I had <laughs> okay. a prayer prayer and planning retreat. Um, <laughs> but I the, my focus is always um, uh, you know a short phrase, but you need to have like a subject and a verb. Uh, so in other words, you can't just say God's grace. <laughs> you have to say, you know, God's grace is available to all or something like that. Or as Jesus showed us in the scripture, um, you know, we are, to, we are called to pick up our cross or something like that. But in essence, you have to have enough of a phrase where it's going to do something and take you somewhere um, and not just like love. That's, 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 that's too broad. Thanks. Uh I wasn't aware of that uh, Tom Long's method, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, what's the hard, What's one of the hardest sermons you've ever preached, and how did you get through it? Yeah, so the hardest sermon I preached was this past November. Uh, sadly, my father passed away, and I was asked to give the eulogy. Um, he, uh, he, and, he and my mother are Roman Catholic, and uh, so obviously I was not allowed to to do their to do the whole service per se. But uh, my mother asked if I could do the eulogy, and I was given special permission. Um, it was very difficult, um, and I would say, you know, for what I did to get through it was I practiced it, uh, practiced it a lot, and I kind of used my method, you know, living with it through the week, and uh, practiced it so I could get my own tears out and my grief out, so that then I could offer it to others. And I would say the same thing applies for, you know, any sermon that is difficult is the more that you live with it and that you're familiar with it um, and that you let it do its work on you. Um, I, I'm sure you've all had that, that experience when you're preaching and all of a sudden you think, oh, <laughs> that was for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> um, and so it's best to kind of have those moments when you can process that, especially if it's emotional. And, uh, and then you can be available to preach it to others. Now, I want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not saying that you should never cry in the pulpit, because I have definitely cried in the pulpit, but you should work through your issues enough so that the energy doesn't shift, so people aren't trying to take care of you, uh, but you're actually making an offering to them. Donnie, you talked about uh, a couple of things already with regard to how you fill yourself spiritually, uh, walking, yoga, mm -hmm. uh, and and are there any uh, what other things do you do? And uh, and then are there any particular books or mm -hmm. resources along those lines? Or what do you what are you reading these days that's that's filling you up? Yeah, so I love to, to read a good novel, uh, just to experience different kinds of writing and uh, also kind of quirky people <laughs> and what they think about. So this past summer, I had some time to read Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. Uh, he's the author of A Man Called Ove and then Giver of Stars, Jojo Moyes. And so just, you know, some quirky people and trying to see how they, how they navigate life, uh, especially people that don't have religion um, I'm always interested in what gives them meaning and, and what are they searching for and how do they, how do they fill that hole? Um, sometimes I'll go to the tried and true like Parker Palmer, Frederick Buechner, Henri Nouwen, just to kind of fill my cup. Uh, poems right now, I'm reading uh, Mary Oliver, spending some more time in nature. Um, Whispers in the Wilderness is a new book I picked up um, and it's by uh, Stensland is his last name. And I, I went to the Rocky Mountains uh, National Park this past summer, and he's a photographer. So he took pictures and then he put a short devotion for each of the pictures. Uh, it's just absolutely beautiful. So I guess in addition to books, I try to find my way to, um, 
to pictures to um, also to music as a different way to to fill my cup and uh, yeah and I, I do I spend a lot of time with words <laughs> mm -hmm. so I do try to find some other other ways to nurture my spirit is there a book of the bible you've never preached on that maybe you either do want to preach on it or you're glad you've never preached on it <laughs> uh yeah, I'm a lectionary preacher, so, you know, kind of straight across the plate usually. Um, but I do try to look for opportunities to do sermon series once in a while, uh, to really explore books that we've never really spent much time with. Um, and one book I haven't preached on as I'm thinking about it is the Song of Song of Songs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I've been reading about more of that through Kim Long's work with that book. And so um, that, that might be fun to, to preach on. Uh, yeah, about, about love. Well, our last part of our podcast is when we have Bandit the Podcat <laughs> make an appearance, and he is always really eager to, uh, to ask questions of our guests. So Bandit, and sometimes we have a sighting, but we're not sure if we'll, we'll get one today, but Bandit asks, Donna, what is your favorite animal and why is it a cat? <laughs> well, Bandit, I wish I could see you to, to, to tell you that uh, sadly, my husband and I are both very allergic to cats. So we do have a nice dog named Sadie, but I'm sure if you were our cat, we would be able to enjoy you. <laughs> what kind of dog is Sadie? She's a rescue dog, but she's part lab, we think, and part um, golden retriever. Mm -hmm. And then she has a really funny curly tail that we're not sure what it is, but uh, she's, she's beautiful. She's a lot of fun. Uh, Bandit would also like to know, what's your favorite bird? Um, I like the blue jays. We have a, a wooded backyard and we've got lots of blue jays that live in the trees. And it's very fun to see them perching on my bird feeder. They're a little too big for it, but they try to make it work anyway. <laughs> to get some seed. And as you know, uh, cats like to play. And uh, I think that's a particularly true for, for Bandit. But what's, game, what, what's one game you could play endlessly without getting bored? Now, I love to play charades um, at Christmas time, especially when the family is together. And uh, it's just so fun to see how people act things out and uh, how goofy it can be. And usually there's just a whole lot of laughter involved. So I could play that for, for a long time. Bennett also wonders, what's the strangest place you've ever taken a nap? Yeah, I wish I had more naps in my life, but I'll never forget the one time I must've been really tired. I went to get a massage to treat myself and I actually fell asleep on the massage table. <laughs> that happens. So I was very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, Bandit wants to know, what food could you eat every single day? Oh, that's an easy one. I'd say chocolate in lots oh. of different forms. <laughs> the darker, the better. <laughs> oh, Donna, uh, thank you for this wonderful book and this great conversation. Um, and to our listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the Working Preacher Books Podcast. Stay up to date on our conversation at workingpreacher.org and follow us on Twitter or Facebook and find the latest in our Working Preacher book series at workingpreacher.org slash books. Thanks for listening.